Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting, amazing lecture on trade. And this time, we're going to take a look at international trade organizations. Yes, those big groups of countries that come together to discuss stuff that is way over our heads. But we're going to try and figure out what exactly they do and why do so many people hate them at times. All right, so make sure you get out your pen and paper. You follow the storm philosophy for note taking. Sit back and enjoy. All right, so what are we going to take a look at today? Well, we are going to discuss what exactly a trade organization is and how this differs from a trade agreement like what we've talked about. We're going to take a look at the major international trade organizations, then we're going to talk about Canada's current involvement and Canada's future. There's some question marks that we have to raise. All right, so trade organization, what are they? Well, it's a group of nations. Now, trade agreements are enforceable treaties between various countries. Trade organizations are groups of countries that have come together to help and promote uh, movement of goods, which is really trade. The idea of eliminating trade barriers, getting rid of tariffs and, and so on, sanctions, embargoes, so on and so forth. Uh, trying to come together to establish terms of trade so it's fair for everyone. And really trying to encourage foreign investment so that all countries around the world, both developing, newly industrializing, and those who are developed, um, can work together to really improve um, standard of living around the world. So here are the major trade organizations. Now the WTO, that's the big one, that's the massive one, that's the one that we're going to take a look at. But we're also going to take a look at APEC, G8, G20, the OECD, the World Bank, the IMF. Now OPEC and ICC are also major trade organizations, but unfortunately we're just not going to take a look at those today as they have less connection to Canada than the other ones. So first up is the WTO, otherwise known as the World Trade Organization. Now this is composed of 153 member countries. That's a lot of people coming together to talk about trade liberalization and that's really what they're trying to do. Get rid of trade barriers throughout the world, uh, trying to encourage economic prosperity and social development is, is really what they're trying to do. Now these 153 member countries have grown from its very early beginning. Um, it used to be the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT organization really, and the WTO sprung from this. Now it provides a forum for negotiations, so where countries can come together and discuss trade disparities and agreeable solutions. It provides a set of rules and guidelines for trade so that um, it's more fair and it's easier to follow and so member countries can really work um, more easily and effectively through through trade and it promotes again more trade through the flow of goods and services. It also provides a dispute settlement forum so this is where countries who uh, maybe are a little bit upset with one another because of trade barriers put in place i.e. Canada and the US with softwood lumber well they come together and the WTO and consults, mediates, and arbitrates these discrepancies and interprets trade agreements and comes to a solution that both countries should, and that's an asterisk, uh, but should agree to. So the key attributes here is that it definitely provides protection of intellectual property. So it, um, Roquefort cheese, for example, Roquefort cheese, uh, it, that, that's protected as an uh, intellectual property and other intellectual property rights around the world. It promotes peace. Again, trade will solve world uh, peace. It also handles dispute settlement process, encourages again free trade and protects the environment. So next up is APEC or the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group and these are 21 member countries uh, Canada being one of them, uh, those countries that are found around the Pacific Ocean. Um, now these countries, uh, although they, there's only 21, does comprise 40% uh, of the globe's population, about 54% of the globe's GDP, and about 43% of international trade. So we're talking some major players when it comes to trade. Um, it's again not established by any treaties, so they don't have free trade agreements in place, but they are come together to enhance economic growth and prosperity for the region, uh, try to strengthen the Asia Pacific community so it's um, more business is more easily conducted and more effective um, and so they really try to promote free trade they really try to encourage economic and technical cooperation so that growth can happen they really try and facilitate favorable and sustainable business environments so that all businesses throughout the Pacific Asia Pacific region can conduct uh, business very easily and that's really what they want to do now they also goes a little bit beyond trade. They're all talk about climate change, security, terrorism, uh, global success, economic success, um, and emergency preparedness for things like tsunamis and other things that affect the region. 
Next up is the G8, or Group of Eight. No, it's not a, a plane or a car, but it is an organization composed of eight countries, which sprung from the G6 way back in 75. Uh, the G7 was followed in 76, and that's when Canada joined, and now the G8, um, when Russia became a, a member in 98. So we now have eight countries, eight major economies of the world, um, really the big economies of the world that come together to solve at macroeconomic issues. So that's the idea of economic issues affecting the whole world, not just individual nations, uh, and really try to discuss other issues such as energy, drugs, information highway, climate control, uh, arms control, crime, terrorism, so on and so forth. Um, key attributes to this, well, it, rotating leadership no one country really uh, controls this. It rotates throughout, and each country hosts an annual summit where they come together and talk about these things. Uh, you might note that the G8 summit planned for this year has been cancelled because, well, Russia is doing what Russia does, and the other countries do not like this, and they will not be meeting to talk uh, because they don't want to meet in Russia, a place which is now um, cloaked in controversy and so that. So we talked about the G8, how about the G20? Well, the G20 sprung from the G8, it's different, it's not an evolution of the G8, it's actually a different organization altogether. It was proposed by, yes, a Canadian former Prime Minister, Paul Martin. Um, it's now membership includes 20 countries. Uh, these countries come together to discuss major eco economic issues uh, of the world, and these are really the 20 major countries of the world. Um, again, it, it filled a need. The G8 just wasn't including enough countries. Uh, think about China. Right? That's a major economy that is not a part of the G8. Uh, and so the G20 does provide a, uh, a forum for these major economies that have come to light in the last uh, 20 years. Um, it also came as a result of major economic crises of the 90s, and so these countries have now been able to come together and talk about it. It's 90% of the world's uh, gross domestic product, 80% of international trade, 66% of the world's population. So it's it really encompasses the majority of the world. Um, again, the purpose is really to strengthen those economic ties throughout um, the world and throughout these countries. Uh, it focuses really on economic and employment growth, eliminating trade barriers, reforming financial institutions, um, and restructuring global financial organizations such as the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and again, they meet uh, annually, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to discuss this as well. Um, typically, it kind of springs on the back of the G8 um, as far as to negotiations and, and that, but uh, it is a separate organization altogether. So let's talk about the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD. Yes, these are 34 countries uh, that have come together to really promote democracy and market economies. The idea is economic growth, expansion in terms of employment, improving the standard of living as a result, uh, sustaining that financial stability, and really helping countries uh, develop economically and enhancing world trade. Um, a, the major uh, function of this organization is really to produce research reports. And these research reports are there focus on various countries and various facets of the economies in these countries to help those countries more effectively make decisions and to see what's kind of going on around the world so they can uh, make more effective decisions as well. So the World Bank, it is not a bank that the world goes to to take out money. It is something slightly different. It's not a traditional bank. Um, it does provide some loans. It does provide uh, some developmental assistance in that in that way. Um, but this purpose is really to provide monetary support for developing countries. So eradicate extreme poverty, achieve universal education, promote gender equality, which is necessary in many of the countries of the world to really improve their economic um, growth, uh, improve health of citizens around the world through AIDS, through child mortality, um, ensure future uh, environmental sustainability, and develop global partnerships for development. Uh, it, so again, it provides those loans to developing countries, it provides monetary and technical support to developing countries, and in this sense it can solve uh, many of the issues that are plaguing this planet. 
And lastly, we got the IMF or International Monetary Fund. Now, these are again 188 member countries, um, and really their purpose is to track and analyze economic trends going around the world. Uh, and by doing so, they're able to encourage countries to adopt more responsible economic policies. Uh, they're able to lend money to emerging countries where they see uh, some economic trends kind of going south. Uh, just going negatively. It provides technical training in, in facets and industries uh, pertaining to finance such as banking um, and therefore they're able to really help economies around the world warn governments of potential financial problems and really provide expertise in a forum for discussion on many things pertaining to finance and economics. So what? So we talked about all of these trade organizations but what does it mean for Canada? Well and Canada's involved with all these trade organizations. They have a, a voice in all of these. I mean, to be a member of the G8, as such a small country, right, 34 million people, an economy that is, is maybe uh, not nearly the same size as the United States, they still have a voice in this, and they have a voice in, in all of these organizations. So they're really able to lend uh, their expertise. I mean, consider the fact in the last recession that many countries looked to Canada uh, for our banking regulations. We were able to not necessarily avoid the last economic recession, uh, but we were able to weather it in a lot uh, more effectively than a lot of of countries. So I think uh, leading up to uh, that uh, recession in 2007, 2008, a lot of people were pointing the finger at Canada and wondering what we were doing in many of these organizations. I think post uh, 2007, 2008, I think a lot of countries have, have kind of realized that Canada des definitely holds a place in these these uh, organizations and because their voice can be uh, uh, heard, they're able to really help and support a lot of these countries uh, through, again, the IMF and the, and the World Bank as far as financial assistance, um, the G8 and the G20 with economic stability, all right? uh, the idea of promoting trade in the Pacific Rim. We see uh, our trade agreements going around the world and, and a lot of uh, expertise in this area. Um, the World Trade Organization, we are a major player in terms of trade, so I think that we uh, also have a, a strong role in this. So. Um, even though we might be a small country, we definitely have a role in all of these, and I think that benefits many Canadian businesses as a result. So I kind of touched on these previously, but Canada, uh, well, it does face some challenges in the future. The idea of our, our membership in the G8, um, I mean, we don't necessarily have a, a huge population and a huge economy. So many countries have asked uh, whether or not Canada should be replaced. Um, maybe it, in the G20, should we be such a, a front and center economy, or maybe we should be a second tier country in the G20, uh, kind of a rule taker instead of the rule maker um, that happens happens when you go from you know, first tier to second tier. Um, so that, that could seriously impact Canadian business connections around the world. Um, the G8, I mean, we're not necessarily that big, but we do have a role to play. But again, if we lose that position, that's uh, that could be substantial. As far as the WTO, I mean, we are a uh, a nation founded on trade, right? If we look back to history, you know, and we still are our economy depends on this trade. I mean, we are the ninth largest exporter in the world, tenth largest importer. Um, so we have a, a significant role in the WTO, but that's always questionable as far as how much of a role we should be given. Well, that brings us to the end of our lecture. So here's your, your takeaway question. Um, all these trade organizations really do various different things, and Canada has a role in all of them. But what benefits do Canadian businesses receive from these organizations? How is Canada's involvement with each of these really benefiting uh, the various multinational corporations or even just national corporations in Canada? So consider that. Um, but that's it. That's all. That's everything. We will see you tomorrow.